Hello and welcome to 27th lecture of the course on corrosion, environmental degradation and surface engineering. The topic of this lecture is maintenance and introduction. We have discussed this topic a number of times in previous lectures, but I felt that maybe one dedicated uh, lecture should be given on the maintenance itself. Now, if I look at the definition of the maintenance, uh, even in dictionary what it says that keeping something in good condition, the maintenance of body, maintenance of the even uh, our day to day tools like a cycle, motorbike or maybe car. And something in this such way that is why we say felt that in our course something is related to machines or buildings and more focus on the machines. Now, if I want to define in my words what I will say the maintenance is a basically to monitoring machines to identify and correct potential failure. Now, earlier I given emphasis on the that fault need to be uh, identified and corrected. When failure happens we cannot correct it immediately maybe for the next design we can correct. So, that is why we are using the word here potential failure a fault which will be leading to the failure or which has a potential to fail. So, potential failure word has been utilized in this case. So, again what can I say there the monitoring machines to identify and correct uh, potential failure before it really happens before to the event or before the failure. Two common uh, maintenance approaches have been uh, utilized and I am not going to cover those two what is that is a preventive maintenance our one is a corrective maintenance. What is a preventive maintenance is basically a regular inspection like you know removing dirt and oiling or cleaning suppers and then uh, figuring out something that is a preventive maintenance it can be time bound after once uh, once in a week once in a 14 days depends. Our one is a corrective maintenance we keep a huge inventory of the items and then whenever there is a some failure we replace that part that is all and then machine again will be working. That is uh, these, these two approaches have been utilized uh, over the number of years in number of companies. These are the popular and I am not going to describe these two approaches we will be basically going about the condition based monitoring. Now, why uh, there is a need to uh, give emphasis a separate lecture on maintenance reason being that most of the companies they feel that maintenance is a kind of burden is a kind of necessary evil on them now uh, particularly uh, burden on the operation and treat this maintenance aspect as a unneeded overhead. So, if you look at the many companies they keep a some budget only for maintenance it may be like a 5 percent if you go beyond that it is not available. So, try to minimize the maintenance as low as possible and that creates a more problem. Uh, that is why we are switching over to condition based maintenance. So, instead of going for the corrective maintenance where we have a lot of inventory which it will be costing a lot and we know very well in inventory if the item is kept for the 3 years or 5 years again that the life will be over and we need to discard it and it particularly happens with a number of machine components. Similarly, that uh, preventive maintenance is a time based maintenance ok after 2 weeks we will do this after 1 month we will do this. So, that kind of uh, preventive maintenance again the time based instead of that we go hard the really usage based how much is it been utilized and the, the machine has been utilized and then what kind of a correction measure uh, what kind of measures we really require to uh, minimize uh, failures chances of failure. However, as I mentioned here the most many companies they treat uh, this maintenance as a unnecessary overhead and they want to really discard it and we are giving a lot of emphasis on that just uh, to uh, the highlight what is the real importance. I again take uh, this example of the Bhopal gases uh, tragedy which happens in 1984 in India and uh, major thing was that the methyl isocyanide was leaked in a year. Uh, it could cause around 2500 death whatever the as per the one report I do not have exact number, but as per I am following one of the report and then uh, more than 2 lakh uh, people got a uh, lifelong injuries and illness. So, there was a huge loss to society and then whenever there is a huge loss to society naturally company also will vanish or uh, maybe then they have to pay a huge amount. 
So, if they are trying to save some proportion of the money, but maybe ultimately they will lose almost everything. Now, why this happened? Uh, again, as per the one report, they mentioned that in the, the refrigeration system was shut down uh, months before the Delhi that it very even happened. Reason being to the save the cost, but because of the, in the shutting down of the refrigeration system, which was supposed to keep this uh, methyl isocyanide at a uh, temperature around 0 degree could not be maintained. So, operating temperature in uh, and then the most of the Indian country and the cities will be around 20 to 40 degree. So, temperature increases and that increases the possibility of the, the leakage of uh, MIC into the air. So, this was a one failure or maybe the one maintenance was not kept in now order. However, second also whenever there this kind of a volatile gas are used, we use a scrapper, gas scrapper. And then uh, uh, if there is any leakage, it will get absorbed there itself, it will not come to the air. But that uh, then the scrubber itself was a non-functional, so it was not in a working condition. So, first value and then second value. Then comes the third, if the gas get leaked also, then we have a big chimney uh, pipes and uh, then finally, it should go to the very high air. Uh, and then the atmosphere may be the height of the around 30 meter to 40 meter and then it gets a uh, and the release under that environment and then there is a possibility to burn that gas there itself. However, that also was uh, not in the mountain. reason being there was a corroded pipe and then they shut off that unit also. So, the three in a sequence one is a refrigeration system then comes a scrubber then comes a corroded pipe. If you if you go with this kind of a strategy or maybe the maintenance strategy, that means uh, there is a there is a lot of uh, cost cut towards the maintenance, and ultimate the major failure happens, and that society has to pay for that. So that's why we want uh, to give a lot of emphasis on a maintenance. Uh, how to reduce the maintenance cost? We should do optimization, but not to avoid maintenance. By avoiding the maintenance, we can cut the cost but there will be maybe many times many major losses. And other thing is that the before that itself we take all the risk analysis calculate whether really maintenance is required or replacement will be required or maybe say the corrective maintenance will be fine. So, those kind of calculations, but if calculation indicate very clearly that corrective maintenance will not be suitable because of the this, this risk involvement, we should not take a, a maintenance lightly we should immediately switch over to the condition based maintenance. That is why we are trying to describe in the this lecture. Now, as I mentioned the maintenance uh, and, and uh, we, we have studied in previous lectures uh, that almost every physical system may be in the, in the even the subsystem or component it deteriorates with the time. Now, deterioration may happen because of various reasons and the lecture 2, 2, 27 and the 26 we have covered those uh, so many uh, deterioration uh, methods and that why it happens and what is what should be done how to detect also those things. So, every physical system or component deteriorate with the time. So, maintenance procedures are essential to ensure safety and effectiveness, safety for the, uh, the machine, safety for the people also, and safety for the environment also. So, when we really require the safety of the people, environment and company then maintenance is very essential particularly for the risky uh, um, the, the systems. Now, that is why we say that maintenance must be uh, carried out to ensure risk is continuously managed. So, we are maintaining the risk well within the limit and then uh, we are not taking it lightly. And then uh, whenever the uh, operation starts, we should start the maintenance. And there is another one that during operational time, uh, it should be continuously monitored that is what we mentioned the condition based monitoring and then we will uh, discuss those things. So, it should be conducted to monitor and repair and wherever there is a need to repair immediately we should uh, look into that. So, we do not want failure, we want to detect probable failure, potential failure based on faults and that is about a complete uh, theme of this course detect other fault level should not proceed towards the failure and for that purpose the condition based maintenance is important and that is what we are going to 
uh, discuss today or maybe in this lecture. Now, just to uh, highlight a little uh, more, uh, there are number of the papers which have indicated uh, because of the lack of maintenance what happened to the machines. And then uh, one of the paper I am referring which is uh, which was published in 2014, they analyze uh, various uh, big accidents which happened from 2000 to 2011 and uh, they quoted around 183 accident related to chemical industries. And uh, uh, the chemical industry which required or maybe incorporate uh, hydrocarbons and some sort of ha hazardous chemicals which are really very very essential to be uh, and then, then, uh, capped or, uh, within, a, within a unit itself, it should not be released in a environment. So, they, they uh, use the material handling equipment, processing a units and a storage devices and then what they showed that uh, out of the 183, 44 percent failure happened even there was a some sort of maintenance, but they realize also if maintenance would have been there then there would have been more problems. So, that is why they written that uh, there was a declined accident trend in uh, 44 uh, percent uh, industries of maybe where the uh, maintenance was uh, kept uh, um, uh, to some extent not complete based uh, not a condition based, but some extent. They also mentioned that around 50 percent uh, and the, the failure happen or accident may happen because of the lack of barrier or minimum uh, maintenance requirement. Some and then the problem came from a deficient design organization and resource management and that percentage is huge 85 percent that means maintenance was not given due weight. There will be some defect naturally when we design or fabricate that need to be identified they need to be corrected. Now, because of the deficient design if the failure happens naturally there was a no uh, maintenance strategy at all. Similarly, if the there was a less, less interest of the organization and maybe resource was not given or resource was not aligned particularly whenever there was a some sort of fault and then we say okay, let it go no worry about that and then uh, there will be a major accident. So, this is a very huge percent is 85 percent. Another one was that even though there was something like uh, maintenance, but there was a some not a good planning no good scheduling and there was no uh, and then the fault diagnosis as I mentioned that fault diagnosis is very very important and that percentage is also huge 69 percent. So, that is why the major incident happen when the we do not uh, really go ahead with the fault diagnosis we wait for the failure naturally that the major accident will happen or we do not give resources for the maintenance we do not align a strategy according to that then there will be possibility of the of failure. So, there is a need to really look into the on the on the, so the data or which are we are getting after the, uh, the, the when equipment is start working when it is an operation we keep getting data and then based on the data we should make a maintenance strategy. So, let me uh, uh, we say the express in the manner if we have a some maintenance strategy maybe we have picked up maintenance strategy from some data book from some existing literature or maybe from our uh, seniors who have made a some uh, maintenance strategy. But that maintenance strategy should be changed with the time and maybe the new technologies, new sensors. So, if some maintenance strategy was designed earlier and we did not have a good detection method to the find out the faults, keeping same maintenance strategy there is no use of that. When we are improving the technology maintenance strategy should change and that is what we are focusing in present lecture. Now, what I, uh, and I mentioned in my all uh, previous lectures if you look at we have always look at the uh, degradation uh, so surface degradation mechanism was explained in lecture 2 then possibility of the failures uh, because of the wear wear mechanisms uh, in the lecture 3, 4, 5 then uh, the, 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 this 3 lecture was solely for the wear mechanisms then we discuss in uh, lecture 6 fatigue, uh, fatigue and melting diffusive wears then fracture and the surface degradation and again in 9 and 10 we talk about the surface degradation 11th we talk a synergetic effect. So, everywhere we focus what are the possible failure mechanisms we try to give some sort of uh, depth uh, to understand why the failures will occur and once we have a logic and we have a system we know the mechanism we can relate it 
and that will really help to make up uh, frame a good maintenance strategy. Then we also mention about the fractography to understand even the system is working well, but there is a some sort of uh, environmental change and that causes a some sort of surface degradation. So, those th three uh, topic were covered in three lectures and number of case studies were covered in that. So, even everything went well or maybe was designed well and then we put in a, on a, on a product in a market, but because of the change in environment there was a some problem. So, those things also we need to be detected and then we try to cover uh, in those three lectures. Then we mention about the various uh, testing methods. So, testing will be based on some sort of guidelines, some sort of principles and some sort of sensors. So, those same things were covered in a lecture uh, maybe 16 was introduction and 72, uh, 20 we co covered in a non destructive testing. Then how to select appropriate uh, uh, non destructive testing also was covered. After that we realize that you know we need to also learn from a past from a literature. So, how to digitize existing literature because most of the engineering uh, data are available in graphical form. So, we need to convert in digit form and then we need to really go ahead with a data driven approach. We can make a model uh, from a data whichever available. We make a some sort of a regression model or maybe some other model and based on that model we apply digital driven or data driven approach. And as we are getting newer and newer data during operation, we should keep changing our model which has been which has been made from historical data. So, that was a discussed in uh, this uh, lecture 22. We also mentioned about uh, that there may be many many factors when I start working on any design or maybe any failure mechanism or any fault di uh, diagnosis, there will be many parameters available to us. But we need to figure out which parameter are very sensitive, which parameters are really affecting. That is why we did a principal component analysis uh, PCA and then we say that maybe top 3, top 4, top 5 can be selected maybe to maybe cover almost 90 percent of the effect that can be utilized. Then uh, we discuss something about what is the difference between the fault and failure and uh, last two lecture 25th and 26th we have covered about the failure mode and effect analysis. This really gives us a some sort of understanding of existing system and previous lecture was completely on uh, permanent magnetic bearing where we that system was a new and we try to figure out why the failures occur. And then uh, even though the initial sentence was something like oh this bearing will work very, very well, there will not be anywhere, there will be no friction and we found all failure happen. Now, to understand the system also we required a FMEA and then to really improve that system also we required FMEA and quite possible we make a model based on FMEA and then use for the, uh, and the, the implement in a current situation quite possible the data may vary because there is a need to continuously update. Now, in this uh, in the, the occurrence will change right even though we know the CVD level may remain same, but occurrence because of the different different scenarios there may be there is a possibility of the suit formation in some situation and that because of suit formation there will be more like a abrasive wear or maybe the some sort of other wear formation that need to be accounted. So, occurrence will change. So, that is why we need to think about the data driven FMEA and that will be discussed in our present lecture that we already have covered two lecture on FMEA, but we really require to update if you want condition based maintenance to be improved significantly that we require data driven FMEA to be incorporated and then utilized with a condition based maintenance. Now, we are going to discuss uh, about the maintenance strategies to some extent uh, even though this lecture is introductory lecture and I will not be covering many maintenance topics, but just for the completeness I am just trying to connect to some with the one curve what we have already discussed in the wear mechanism that is what we call a bathtub curve. What is a bathtub curve? We say infant uh, uh, mortality rate will continuously go down that has been shown over here with the time and then uh, wear of the, uh, the system will continuously increase with the time. And because of this two composed uh, curve is something like bathtub curve will come something like this. This was discussed earlier. Now, shape may be little bit different, but the way we are trying to project the shape will be like a bathtub curve. It can be something like this, this and this also. 
there is a possibility right. So, but mechanism will be more or less same. Now, similar kind of curve can be uh, utilized for the possible failure uh, uh, maybe say this is one of the literature uh, which indicate this failure, uh, the possible failure curve. Uh, I am just trying to uh, explain the maintenance strategy based on this curve. Even though there may be a number of drawbacks of this curve, we are not going to highlight those. Even though uh, if you go through the literature, people will mention about the number of drawbacks, it has a limitation. But just to explain maintenance in a one slide, uh, this is a, I believe is good uh, method. So, in this case what has been mentioned here that when we do design, there is a no need of the maintenance and maintenance will start when we do installation. And we also have observed that initially we do not face many problem because the installation is generally done by company and everything has been done with a lot of precision. Company person who knows the system very well, upon our operator may learn from that person, but may not be 100 percent. So, that, that this, this curve says that during in installation period maybe say whatever the date time given most of the time uh, the companies give some sort of a one year maintenance free or something or maybe 6 months free or 3 months free quite possible they may not have a many failure at that time. Real failure will start after that and that is what we say the P point. So, installation to P uh, they find there is no failure. This this curve says that, but may not be correct for every situation, but may be um, for the some system. Now, point at which failure may begin, now here failure may begin does not mean the failure will occur, may be there is a possibility of the fault generation and final failure is happening at the F point. So, P is initiation of some sort of fault and then F is something like the where the fault has progressed significantly and failure happened. So, this is what they define the P to F whatever the this interval will be like a what is a life of the system that is a residual useful life of the system. That means, as a time progress this R U L will continuously decrease. So, if you have defined maybe 3 years a life of the component and then already you have covered 1 naturally remaining it will be 2 years. So, this is a what that they try to indicate. Now, beyond that there is a functional failure custom may be the system has not broken in two parts, but function intended function from a system is not really fulfilling the function. So, that is what we say the functional failure and after that what we will do either if it has happened the system level we cannot do much, but if it has happened in the component level then we can do breakdown maintenance or corrective maintenance we replace that maybe one bearing has failed, maybe one gear has failed, maybe one clutch has failed, maybe one brake has failed we replace that that is what we call as a breakdown maintenance system will be on a halt for some time maybe um, maybe few hours maybe few days maybe a few months depends on the whether uh, that the component is available in inventory or not. So, that is why the many times the companies keep very good inventory and I have seen in the companies have many many bearings are in inventory. You just tell this bearing has fell immediately they will bring maybe in a half an hour the system will be up. So, there is another one that inventory management they do and uh, this is what we call uh, the corrective maintenance or uh, breakdown maintenance and sometimes people say they run to failure. We do not worry about the maintenance let it fail once it is failed then I will replace it. So, this is also possible maybe one of the maintenance strategy particularly for the low risk uh, products where we do not have much risk. We know it is not going to deteriorate the environment at all and there is a whatever the we are working on the system it is not very highly uh, sophisticated and it is not really going to give a lot of bottlenecks because of the failure it is kind of a we have many units like this. So, do not worry about that if one machine failed for half an hour, one hour we will shift to the other machine and then we will continue. So, there is a lot of redundancy available. So, this is another one strategy, but we are not talking about this as I mentioned initially the precision maintenance is mostly done at the company's level and then they will do needful. So, this is not of our use, this is also not of our use. Now, next in between comes some sort of a uh, condition based maintenance sometimes people we use the word a predictive maintenance what will happen and if I know the failure uh, if I know the fault and I am able to estimate what will be the residual useful life and when the failure will progress to a significant level I can do a appropriate maintenance strategy. 
Our one is the time based maintenance what we call a preventive maintenance and this is again based on the data available yeah the oil need to be changed once in a, uh, 5 years or once in a 2 years or once in a 6 months those are the preventive maintenance or uh, maybe we need to do this kind of regular cleaning or maybe we need to do overhauling once in a month something like that. So, this kind of uh, things can be uh, utilized however, in this case what we have realized also that uh, there, there, there are number of parameters which can be utilized as a signature quite possible with the time vibration level will change quite possible oil color will change oil viscosity will change oil acidic number will change or oil basic number will change similarly the temperature profile also will change over the time or uh, maybe the noise level will be different maybe heat generation will be different. So, these are the variables available and we have a sensors to detect those then we can really relate or uh, we can make a condition based maintenance or we can say predictive maintenance based on these uh, variables which are available. I have given only the 5 parameters here, but does not mean only these 5 there can be number a huge number depend on the system which we are going to utilize. As I mentioned in the beginning itself for this curve I am just trying to utilize only for the understanding purpose. I do not uh, validate that this curve is the curve it is basically just, just to provide some understanding what are the different kind of maintenance and how to think about the maintenance strategy. And then again uh, and, and that depends on the requirement some people go ahead with a lot of inventory some people say no there is no need of inventory and then uh, we can order because we already will have a some sort of a time available yeah we know that this motor is going to fail after 4 months or maybe this bearing is going to fail after 5 months. So, we have sufficient time we can order and within the 3 days or within 5 days the item will be delivered I do not have to keep any inventory every time I will be getting a fresh uh, and the material and then we do not really require that much in inventory also. So, uh, in this case uh, as I already mentioned that uh, here the probability of the failure is uh, checked that is why we can say this is a sometime relation between the failure probability and residual useful life. And, uh, um, and the, the in beginning itself I mentioned that uh, this IP interval uh, few companies may not believe at all you see now once it is started it is our responsibility there should not be a new failure and this is a more common in airline sector uh, particularly aerospace industry they do not believe in IP interval we say no once the machine is started maybe once aeroplane aircraft has come to the usage we should think about immediately maintenance strategy. So, this is a very important aspect now if I whatever I express and if I express in slightly different word I say that the, in this uh, in the, the curve uh, what we call the PF curve we thought about uh, potential failure and functional failure they are two different terms. Now, what we say the potential failure is something like early stage when the potential failure exists, but not yet occur. So, there is a some sort of fault we can detect using any entity method or we can use insert sensor to figure out what kind of fault and we can have a some sort of analytical model maybe the failure mode analysis and figure out what is really happening and going to happen and what will be the impact. So, CVT number or RPN number can be determined based on that and another one uh, we mentioned that uh, uh, we have a number of uh, signatures or maybe say number of parameters number of variable like an abnormal vibration will be there if there is a some sort of clearance or maybe some sort of a temperature rise will be there maybe there will be some noise maybe there will be some sort of other divergence from a normal operating condition. So, we have also database related to normal operating condition what should be the normal operating condition and how what sensor is really indicating and then already we have covered up the one gear example where we mentioned that the normal gear was a working in a nice condition and the crack gear and then, then there is a the broken gear we already have discussed about those things. So, we compare with a normal operating condition if there is a deviation we can think of there is something wrong and then we need to figure out residual useful life and then immediately work on this. So, at this is step I believe that the condition based maintenance can be utilized can be implemented when the properly and that is the right way. Other thing which we have mentioned about the functional failure which means that failure has progressed to an actual failure that failure has happened really that is actual failure and then uh, the system cannot uh, be 
utilized immediately, there will be naturally a breakdown of the system and then the downtown will be there and then if there is a safety issue, we should not reach to this and there is no safety issue, we can think little bit about that situation. That there is no safety, there is no uh, even the breakdown and then we have a redundant machines, so it is not really going to uh, become a, a, a bottleneck for the system, so there is no issue at all. And in this situation, we go hard with only corrective maintenance and then uh, we, we say that this is uh, okay for us. Now, new a better thing will be that what is the functional failure? Now, somewhere the people say the functional failure, my efficiency is going lesser than 95 percent, the functional failure happen. If the other companies say no, instead of 95 percent, I will think about 85 percent. Somebody say no, no, unless there is a broken or maybe everything has a been on the damage completely done only there is a functional failure. So, this is a slightly subjective, now it can vary from one company to other company, one team to the other company, uh, other team. So, in this situation also the whatever the residual or maybe remaining, remaining usable uh, useful life or RUL will be also slightly different. So, this is important to understand. Maybe one company says uh, RUL is a 5 years, other company say 10 years, a third company say 3 years. All 3 are possible because there is a definition or they, they will have a different definition of the functional failure. Now, as I mentioned something about the corrective maintenance, we say cor corrective maintenance is implied only, only, only or maybe will you be useful only when, when the condition based or preventive maintenance is neither technically practical. We do not have so many uh, units available, we do not have sensors, we do not have a technology at all and then kind of the machine which I am using is all in the age old and we do not have to worry too much or we already have a data related to cost. So, we say it is not really cost effective to implement uh, maintenance or condition based maintenance or even preventive maintenance or maybe to some extent I can use the preventive maintenance. So, those things are important. One is the technology is not available, second thing is the safety is not an issue and the machine is not very costly. So, why shall I use maybe say there is a machine cost overall is a 1 lakh rupees and then somebody says the maintenance cost is a 5 lakh rupees naturally we will not go for the maintenance based. So, these are the some sort of a data and however, I am, I am, I am in present lecture I am assuming that condition based maintenance is really required. Now, question comes whatever the curve I should be of curve it is completely on a time based and I am talking something like a condition based. Are they really related? No, they are not that much related. So, I, uh, uh, in my view condition based maintenance is a better approach compared to the time based uh, maintenance that is uh, useful for the preventive maintenance, but that to describe overall approach related to maintenance that is why I adopt take that curve or PF curve, otherwise I may not really require PF curve to go ahead with the condition based maintenance and it is uh, only just to explain other maintenance strategy, so that I can say what is a condition based maintenance. Now, let us see what is the condition based maintenance. Uh, in NDT uh, we have uh, 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 they covered almost 4 to 5 lecture and then everywhere we had a different kind of sensor suit, sensor unit. Once the sensors are available, we um, the, uh, get the some data from that and then those data acquisition happens either through the some sort of uh, um, uh, FAQ method or maybe say some sort of uh, data acquisition system. And the once data acquisition system has happened and of course, my previous lecture I described that also that we do need to do a data processing. There may be the possibility of the denoising the data, there is a possibility of that there are some data are missing, there may be some sort of uh, in the lack of the data then we need to really uh, bridge those data, we need to do a processing, so that we do not have a discontinuity in data. So, data processing is very essential, then based on that we can think about a diagnosis system that whatever we heard got the data, we process the data, what kind of the failure is there. So, we try to detect the fault and then uh, uh, we can do go ahead with the separation between the noise and the uh, useless uh, data and the fault related data that is why we are using the word fault isolation and then based on that we can go ahead with the fault identification and this fault identifications require some data from a previous um, and then the knowledge to compare. Once it has been identified this is the kind of the fault, maybe the kind of the wear fault or maybe kind of the misalignment fault or maybe kind of uh, uh, thermal degradation fault or maybe uh, and then the some sort of uh, 
fault which is already known in a system. So, a fault has been identified. Then comes a prognostic approach. What is a prognostic approach? What is really relation? How do I go hard with the maintenance? I know there is a some crack, maybe 5 mm below the surface. How do I take a strategy to really go hard with the next? Either I calculate a residual life, I say no, there is a crack, maybe after 2 years it will fail like this. So, everything has been known to us and then maybe when there is a major overhaul then we can change the system. So, that comes a prognostic approach. So, that is why we say that based on the past performance of the system prognostic approach uh, estimate how long a part will work under certain condition. So, that is a one way. Our one is that maybe use some sort of uh, uh, and the, the, the elements to bridge that crack to close the crack maybe change the load condition to maybe some sort of uh, additional uh, requirements. And of course, this completely depends on the functional requirement, what is our functional requirement, uh, what kind of efficiency, what kind of temperature requirement, what kind of uh, and, and the, the wear tolerances and maybe what are the available resources to us also to compare. Based on that we can decide a maintenance strategy. Now, this maintenance strategy can be automated or can be decided by maintenance manager, it depends. Now, if it is automated then we really require many many data to be processed continuously and updated continuously. However, the maintenance manager may have a lot of exposure, a lot of experience, tested knowledge. So, he will know or she will know how to really monitor it and then take a suitable action based on this. So, these are the important aspects related to condition based maintenance. So, what we say to get the best quality, dependability and availability decision maker or maybe the manager or maybe it can be automated need to handle information well and make a good decision. So, if it is a even the tacit knowledge person has a lot of exposure he or she should document those also. So, the future somebody should learn it should not happen the person gets retired and maybe other person comes and then everything is changes. So, this is important aspect and then the all the decisions should be made based on the some criteria that should be documented well. And sometimes we say that if you go for the more automation then data analytics will be required to provide insight uh, into the uh, maintenance planning, how we are changing or how when the whatever the maintenance uh, um, and the decisions were made whether it has improved to some extent or deteriorated to some extent maintenance uh, in the, in the management if it is the next time we need to improve it. So, this is towards the management of uh, the automatic uh, management while in this case the maintenance person comes or maybe maintenance manager is taking decisions and then we can uh, get a good results overall. Now, uh, how to monitor uh, it has been covered in uh, earlier number of lecture how to monitor the condition we say that uh, and then the we can monitor the faults based on the sensors you know sensors can be any number like in a vibration case we use accelerometer and when we use accelerometer we know there is a amplitude versus the data point. Now, this data point can be converted to um, the time span or maybe can be converted to the frequency span that that is what we can do in this situation. However, once the faults have been diagnosed or uh, maybe the, this uh, uh, data have been acquired uh, then need required a data processing and then based on that we calculate the uh, what kind of the fault we are getting. Now, there will be number of method we can use eddy currents also, we can use acoustic emission sensors also, we can use a stress strain DIC methodology, we can use a thermographic images, we can use ultrasonic uh, uh, sensors in that. Uh, they are there are huge number of uh, sensors available uh, in the literature. However, in my lab uh, I generally use vibration analysis, I use oil analysis and I use infrared thermography. These are the three major thing of course, wear debris analysis, uh, wear debris collection that is a what we are treating this as a part of the oil analysis. Now, vibration analysis uh, we generally use accelerometer, it can be one directional accelerometer, can be three directional accelerometer. We calculate the temperature as a time uh, and then the uh, data point based, based on the data point time and then frequency and then uh, we compare amplitudes. And then uh, to figure out to is there any misalignment we can diagnose based on the frequency is there an unbalance is there is any bear we and bearing wear some sort of response will come and some sort of mechanical looseness again the kind of misalignment will occur. And this is a mostly uh, implemented this vibration analysis mostly implemented for the motors pumps and any anything which is rotating. 
it is a more useful in this case and then people say most of the time that for the and then the majority of the rotating machineries vibration analysis is used extensively almost to 60 to 65 percent cases the vibration analysis is used exclusively. While coming to the oil analysis in my view unit uh, and my thinking wherever the oil has been utilized oil analysis give a very good results to us reason being that uh, lubricant keep uh, circulating. Now, by uh, circulation of the lubricant I get get a I can get a temperature, I can get a wear debris, I can get a really moisture, I can get a really the corrosion possibilities those things are possible using the um, and the lubricating oil they will take a lubricating oil and then take an analysis of that. So, this provides me the, the, the presence of wear debris and some sort of the pollution even the dust um, is there or uh, maybe the soot formation is there or maybe some sort of black powder or maybe the even the fatigue some sort of uh, the debris keep coming or even oxy and the oil has got oxidized because of the air entrapped or maybe some other reason there is a change in viscosity either viscosity thinning or viscosity thickening there is a some sort of a depletion of additives maybe the, the life oil which has been utilized it has uh, spent its own life maybe 2 years 3 years and need to be replaced. Now, this kind of uh, analysis is most commonly used in engines, uh, gearboxes, hydraulic system or anywhere wherever there are lubricating oil is being utilized in the machineries. So, if uh, oil has been supplied to the, and then the two machineries then we will go ahead with the oil analysis. If oil is not there or maybe the only the grease is used there is no circulation of oil then I will go with the vibration analysis. Now, somewhere and the vibration and, uh, and then the is not really giving very good results and I know there is a some sort of high friction high impact or maybe some, some sort of uh, and the, the temperature is increasing somewhere in places. So, then I can think about infrared thermography which we have just studied in uh, non destructive testing. What we say we use uh, cameras to capture the infrared radiations which generally emitted by the body whichever is operating uh, maybe the having a temperature more than absolute 0 uh, Kelvin and then anywhere overheating uh, localized even the localized overheating can be detected. So, in all analysis we can give a generalized overheating while in this case uh, we can get really an open point which portion is getting overheated or there is a some sort of uh, uh, electrical failures maybe current is not getting passed or maybe there is a some sort of uh, breakage or maybe there is a some sort of insulation problem or there is a over friction or maxima more friction those things can be detected using a infrared thermography. However, as I mentioned these are the just indicative, but there are many many sensors which can be utilized for uh, uh, diagnosing the condition of a system. Now, uh, as I mentioned in our uh, the, the lab what we do uh, we do a, 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 a number of other system. But here I have described something like uh, how to monitor the condition of a spur gear and uh, the spur gear unit has been mounted over here uh, in this case and then uh, we have a couplings and we, we, we have a wear debris sensor also to figure out what is the, the, the number of debris which are coming out which is really good sensor or maybe it gives a really good uh, signals to us and uh, this has been shown and in addition whatever the, and then the moisture gets mixed with the oil that also can be measured even the change in viscosity of the oil that can also be measured using uh, this kind of unit. So, we have a, a kind of a complete set test setup to figure out uh, and then the, uh, what is going wrong with the gear mechanism. Now, here we are using only spur gear, but helical gears also can be utilized other gear can be utilized whichever gets lubricated can be utilized. In addition we also uh, mount a gearbox uh, then the accelerometer on the gearbox to collect the uh, signals we do necessary TSA and then uh, necessary condition monitoring uh, in the of the whatever the analysis tools to be utilized and then try to figure out uh, comparing the matching frequencies and then fee whether there is a some sort of uh, damage to the surface or uh, there is a some sort of misalignment those can be diagnosed also. Now, here in this case I am just showing the results of uh, that uh, test setup which has been shown in this case uh, because um, and then the uh, gears are made of the steel and, uh, and then the wear particle will contain iron uh, in this and then that has been shown here and this this uh, in the graph this 
uh, span is showing some sort of what is the variation in this case and this value is a mean value 61,000 particles while in this case there is a 73,000 particles, there is a 66,000 particles that has been shown. Now, we have a debris sensor that is what of this case a more than 40 micron particle, uh, more than 16 micron particles and the more than 100 micron particles and in this setup we are able to really see what will happen uh, to the gear if it is exposed to almost negligible um, on the acidic condition. So, that is why we also perform the test on that 0 0.00025 percent of uh, um, SCL or aqueous SCL which has a 36 percent uh, SCL and remaining water those things were uh, utilized and of course, uh, to test uh, different kind of the materials and impact of the materials on the lubricating conditions or uh, on the overall failure of the system we also use a nano additives. So, overall uh, response can be seen uh, on, on the utilizing this and then we can say here that uh, uh, with addition of uh, without a CL uh, we are getting uh, on the 66,000 particles with, uh, with uh, SCL corroding media naturally the corrosion has increased the wear rate also the more particles are coming when we are thinking about a nano additives because in earlier case studies also mentioned that whenever nano powders or nano uh, technology has been utilized we are getting better and better results. So, in this case also nano additives were used. So, instead of 66,000 with without SCL now with SCL and nano additives. So, nano additives really give significantly good performance even in the presence of corrosive media. So, this indicate even in corrosion type or maybe even there is a some, most of some sort of atmospheric corrosion if you use a technology if you use a science we can still get a better results. So, that has been shown in this case while in this case uh, and then the we have shown that um, micron particle size as the size of the particle increases the wear damage to the surface will increase. So, these are the related to the gear uh, wear. So, we get a more and more uh, particle a bigger bigger particle when uh, we are uh, talking about uh, the corrosion of the gear. So, with SCL you can see the red color uh, the block is always on a higher side and then uh, in this case uh, particularly the smaller one uh, has been shown here uh, that is a, a nano particle with a nano particle. So, even somewhere which was happening on creating a very large particle size that has shifted to the this side. So, the, 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 the again uh, where uh, in, in the presence of nanoparticles has reduced significantly and that is the advantages. So, when we understand the science and then we utilize a nanotechnology many uh, surface degradation process can be halted can be reduced can be minimized right. So, in this case we have used a sensor online uh, FE sensors which uh, we have another one is a mass sensors also and then uh, we uh, as I mentioned that we are debris metallic sensor the company's uh, name also has been mentioned that from where we have purchased this. Now, we will just uh, in the, in the take one example uh, which has been uh, picked up from a literature that was published in 2021 and the title of that paper is a data driven failure mode effect analysis. So, FMEA we have already covered now in this case they have uh, utilized a data driven approach. Uh, with the FMEA to enhance the maintenance planning. So, how do we really improve the maintenance? So, in with a based on the FMEA I can plan some maintenance, but when we get a realistic data we get a actual data can we improve that. So, that is what with the data driven approach. So, they, they suggest some sort of framework over here you can see the first module is a physical world that means the system. When on the earlier FMEA we say that you understand the system. So, they, they understood the system and then they figure out what are the different kind of the failure modes uh, related to that system and then uh, what kind of maintenance strategy people are using for that purpose. So, they have done it. Now, after that we when we mount the sensor and then we try to procure uh, maybe the key features uh, in uh, even the permanent magnetic bearing we mentioned about the key features what are the failure modes. And then if we keep getting the data based on that we understand the system slightly better and better manner we may improve the, you know, the system or maybe data processing and we bring to the cyber world. Cyber world is a new thing in this case we are trying to uh, go ahead with a uh, simulation or the 3D simulation of a real system a physical system and that is why here the 
and then I mentioned that um, we are using a cyber system. Now, what is really in this case? Basically, when we are thinking about the data driven approach, uh, in RPN in this case, we know that initially severity is known to us, detection sensor we are not yet, yet changing, but occurrence will change. In this space, uh, if I go ahead with only physical mode, I will have some sort of occurrence. It can be you know, another 5 different values and then occurrence may be um, and the number may be 1 to 10, we can say 6, 8, 9. And then here in real situation maybe 6 turns out to be 7 or 6 turns out to be 5. So, actual case this is a based on history what initially we made while this is in a real situation what we are getting. So, this is uh, important when data driven uh, FMEA we get real data and then we can, uh, we can change the occurrence uh, number. Uh, which has been in this case particularly they have given 1 to 10 and in my previous lecture I mentioned it can be 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. While well, in this case and then this paper it gives a 1 to 10 uh, ranking uh, of the each fault and then the, that is why they have mentioned and once that is done then finally becomes a decision. What kind of decision should be taken? Now, suppose uh, we say that in the, in the RPN of the damage D uh, is 216 that should be uh, corrected first. So, naturally the whatever the corrections the way in and uh, the finite and then this uh, permanent magnetic bearing we have improved the system those can be corrected in this manner. So, in this case we say that okay, damage B and damage D gives a maximum giving the maximum weightage you take a decision how to change the maintenance strategy. So, that this number can come under 100 or come under 150. So, that is that kind of a strategy can be selected. Now, why we are talking about the data driven approach reason being that whatever the data which we initially got we do not have actual environmental influences. Now, there is a possibility that uh, environmental keep changing and we may change continuously the, um, and the maintenance strategy in different different environments or uh, even the, the person the pilot who is uh, flying it they uh, he or she may have a different ways to handle the flight. Even in that situation maintenance strategy may change to some extent. So, that is what has been mentioned over here. Now, as I mentioned the cyber system if we say cyber physical system um, and the people use a cyber physical system as the one, but here the, the, this uh, author has used a cyber physical production system. Some people say cyber physical system. So, here in this case they what they are trying to collaborate uh, on the, the computational what is the, the three dimensional model and complete simulation and physical process. And, uh, uh, as I mentioned that uh, data driven what will it will give a most recent uh, data operational data and then uh, using the iterative procedure and we can optimize we can optimize that data and then the maintenance strategy. So, in real situation in uh, and then the real data acquisition we keep changing the maintenance strategy otherwise the maintenance strategy used to be defined well within advance oh maintenance strategy will be like this, but in this situation now depends on every time the RPN is being calculated and RPN calculation will keep shifting what should be done next right. So, in this situation what uh, the, the when we are talking about uh, uh, in situ uh, arrangement or uh, continuous data acquiring, uh, acquiring the data like in this case they are continuously acquiring data they are continuously processing the data and then they also need to fit in whatever the models uh, which we made based on the initial understanding physical system. So, those models need to be changed also that is why they use uh, they collect the data they try to uh, and, uh, utilize the data whatever they, they, say they are supposed to 100 data they collected. So, 70 data will be utilized for the training purpose the whatever the new model which are they are supposing or maybe even the delta variation in existing model, but again that need to be trained that need to be tested and that need to be validated. It is nothing like you know uh, the cow food method only the cow food method will not be utilized. They utilize the machine algorithms or we say the machine learning algorithm or artificial intelligence to continuously update it. So, they use uh, they particularly in this uh, paper they use a 70 percent data to the train the model make a model based on even existing system, but train so that some coefficient may change then do a some sort of a testing and then finally, do the validation. So, this approach was uh, adopted in this case to get a better results. Now, just to uh, and, and, uh, uh, highlight what they did 
they, they use a data driven approach uh, and this is a word I say the risk priority number they calculate and then the CVRT was already known uh, occurrence is continuously getting updated detection is already known to this. Now, here even I can assume if there is a change in technology detection also will change quite possible the maintenance uh, management decide that I will go for the better detection method then naturally RPN will come down and it will not be that much um, and the high uh, risk priority number. Now, just to give this number what there is each failure mode uh, fall prediction was conducted separately the way we have done in uh, passive magnetic bearing or uh, permanent magnetic bearing whatever the fault we try to ca calculate RPN separately also. And then the, this predicted uh, fault probability for the each failure mode was converted uh, and then between 1 to 10 as I mentioned that they try to rank them 1 to 10. Now, probability failure they found 84 percent. So, they gives as a 8, a probability of the failure is a 90 percent they will give 9. If the probability of failure is a 9.4 or 94 it will they will give 94. Now, this is a possibility uh, I can uh, rank it or can go for the conversions or calculate. While in this case uh, they initially adopted this approach, but subsequently they went from uh, even the decimal level. While uh, preferably we get should give the 1 to 10, so 27 percent like a 2.7 and then uh, and then we do a rounding off it will be 3. So, they are both the approaches we can do a rounding off or go with the decimal I will prefer a rounding off instead of going for the decimals because there is a some sort of subjectivity there may be some sort of a noise in data better we round up those set values. So, this is uh, where the occurrence value will completely change and every time a new risk priority number will be calculated the way we have done in uh, uh, permanent magnetic bearing. Uh, we did uh, some sort of a decision we change a uh, structure uh, instead of uh, going with the steel uh, in the stainless steel structure or uh, we use uh, uh, the rubber material in between. So, again uh, different result came out of that. So, this is a basically a iterative procedure. So, in this case a new risk priority number will be decided based on whatever we have done and then uh, decision uh, support tool for uh, it will act as a decision support tool for maintenance recommendation and then it can define a different maintenance strategy. Now, what is the maintenance strategy to allocate the different resources how many people should be given for the this kind of maintenance activity. <coughs> what is the priority of this maintenance activity? So, these are the approaches which are really required and then uh, let us take uh, what they did. Now, they found uh, in the, in the two areas area 1 and area 2. Now, in this area uh, the, they found uh, the, the left wing failures uh, and then uh, they in left wing failure itself they divided in two part what we call the failure mode A and failure mode B. RPN number for the failure mode is a 64. RPN number for the failure mode is a 216. Alpha, uh, in the, the same thing area 2 in this case they have use a left wing here they use a right and the tail in this case. And then in this case a failure uh, C uh, RPN number is around 140 and this failure mode is RPN number 504 and they have a given this as a red mark. And what is a red in this situation? Now, if this can be utilized in the if uh, else comment or if then comment, this is a in if RPN is uh, uh, the greater than the pre uh, the predefined threshold. Suppose they have kept as a threshold of 400 and it has come to the 504. Naturally, the inspection immediately will be done and then whatever the resources uh, should be allocated for this purpose. So, this is what we can say. So, in this situation we can say there is a failure uh, the D uh, which has been given the maximum emphasis how to avoid this or maybe if there is a number how to bring down this number right. So, maximum emphasis on that and this is related to tail portion right. Now, even though that there is a no, 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 some number in this uh, failure no, no, failure A and failure B, but they are lesser than 504. So, depends on the what maintenance uh, and the unit is deciding what is the threshold the action should be taken. And in this case it was decided the 504 is a maximum only for timing we will take this as a one example and then we will try to reduce this number. So, they now why the, this has changed because uh, uh, we have already have discussed uh, uh, number of uh, um, then the, then the damage mechanism related to environment whether they are passing the cloud then the temperature variation and uh, 
those will be the dust environment that will affect another one is the people on the, on the on person who is really using it the pilot who is using it. So, there are two variables in this case or maybe the two big domain of variables environmental is itself has a number of variables and the person who is driving may be left hand side right hand side and maybe the and then the, the, during cloud uh, is a very high speed low speed depends on the what kind of a control system they are using it. So, they utilize this kind of uh, instruction we look at the area A and area 2 they defined. Now, they say that um, and, uh, and then the after and the going ahead with the strategy that they then uh, they have changed. Now, here now in this uh, after the necessary modification they again uh, recalculate and they found the area A here area 2 and area 3. So, initially uh, tail portion was area 2, but they did a necessary actions I am not discussing what they have done because this complete aerospace related uh, uh, techniques will come. They try to reduce uh, this uh, and then the tail portion RPM which was above 500 the reduced to the 99.6. Now, again I am uh, mentioning here that they reduced it now because this is a less severe. Now, what are the other severe thing the, the fault B becomes a severe fault D becomes a severe here the red color even in the fault C uh, in, the, in the fault B and D and fault C also they have mentioned. Now, there is a need to look at why this kind of a problems are coming. You look at the form and then, uh, and then this uh, failure mode A, they find a severity which we do not have a control for timing, uh, failure B a severity, failure C uh, failure mode C uh, severity, failure mode D severity, failure mode E severity. Now, here look at the detection, failure mode detection uh, is slightly more complex compared to failure mode B that is a uh, we need to look at what kind of sensors. Now, this is for the left wing. Now, coming to the, uh, the failure mode C is a force the same, but failure mode D it is a 6, why there should be 6? Here it has been already 3, then I should make the appropriate the thing arrangement, I should use appropriate sensors for that. So, this is very important. So, do not go just on mathematics when we need to really analyze start thinking if the sensor was very good at the this kind of uh, um, in the failure mode I should come up with a 3 only here why not uh, why 6 which is unnecessary increasing the number. Now, another one you see the, the probability of failure here is of 94 percent while here the failure of probability of the is a 42 percent. So, quite possible the person who is really using it may have a different kind of uh, um, the way to uh, fly the flights or maybe aircraft. So, this is important now coming to the, uh, the probability in this case they have given 9.4 it could have been round uh, round off to the 9 while in this case like a 67 percent they are given 6.7. So, that can be round off to 7 this is uh, where we need to really do some sort of a work on this. So, this is uh, all uh, complete uh, what is say data driven uh, failure mode and effect analysis this can be very very useful uh, when we think about a maintenance strategy or uh, overall how do we really minimize the surface degradation and uh, which is causing the environmental pollution which is causing the cost a significant high cost to the society. When we use this kind of approaches and do uh, with a logic then it will really give the good results to us. So, I believe that this lecture will be very useful to you thank you for your attention thank you.